quite difficult if you are an opposition leader to talk about your country uh, abroad. Because uh, generally speaking, it's always good to defend your country and your nation if you are abroad and, and somehow explain what is happening and, and to show the better face for the foreigners that, uh, that Hungary is, is doing well. But the situation is uh, not so good in Hungary, so that's why I have to be frank with you. But uh, I have to tell you also that uh, I'm in a quite difficult situation because all the words that a socialist politician you know, say in, in abroad always is used in Hungary uh, from the governing party, on the governing party side, that uh, attack the Hungarian Socialist Party. Because they always say that if we tell any critics about the country, then this is an attack not on Mr. Orban, not on the policy of the government, but on the Hungarian people and the nation and the country. And of course, it's a <coughs> lie. Of course, I'm not happy that the European Commission had to start an infringement procedure against Hungary. I'm not happy and I'm not proud that the old Prime Minister, Mr. Orban, is called in Economist, the newspaper, Oddball. I'm not happy that there is a harsh international criticism against my country. I'm not happy with that. I feel sorry because of this fact. But uh, I have to express that uh, all this criticism which is coming from abroad, so of course, is not a left-wing conspiracy, as Mr. Orban wants to tell to the Hungarians in, in the country. In this audience, I don't have to uh, tell several times, but Mr. Barroso, who is the president of the commission, is not a left-wing politician. He's a right-wing politician. He's a conservative politician. No. Uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Uh, Oli Rehn is also a right-wing politician. Angela Merkel also a right-wing politician. And Vivian Redding also is a conservative politician. And the commission which started the infringement procedures against Hungary, the majority of the commissioners are right-wing politicians. So that's why I just to, want to express that the criticism is based on facts and not on the party affiliation. And that's very important. And of course, in Hungary, in the last one and a half years, we several times, times we said the same criticism to the government, but of course with the two third majority, Mr. Orban did not care about this. So first of all, I would like to express some, some main fields which are, which are, I think, uh, in, in trouble in Hungary because of the uh, Fidesz government. The first one is the democratic values, the rule of law, the checks and balances. Now in Hungary, the majority of the people, more than 50%, uh, think that uh, the policy of Mr. Orban is dangerous for the Hungarian democracy. More than 80% of the people say that uh, the country is in the wrong direction because of different uh, reasons. More than 70% of the Hungarians say that the economy of the country is in bad shape. And the expectations for the next 12 months uh, are the same among the Hungarians. So something is wrong with this policy if the majority of the country thinks uh, in this way. So first of all, perhaps you have heard a lot of things because I know that uh, in the Austrian newspapers, as the State Secretary just said, uh, there were several uh, articles and interviews and news about the Hungarian situation. but. What you can say that uh, the Orban government misused the two-third majority. We say in Hungary it's like a tyranny of the majority in the parliament because uh, with the two-third majority they can do whatever they want in, in Hungary, they can change whatever they want uh, in the Hungarian legislation. It's not unprecedented, I mean, the two-third majority because between 1994 and 98 there was a government with a 72 percentage of support in the parliament. It was all government with Mr. Jula Horn. Uh, of course, we were in coalition with the liberals, but together we had a 72 percentage of uh, support in the government and majority. But in that time, the prime minister, Mr. Jula Horn, said that you have to keep in mind that this two, two third majority is a very dangerous tool. So you have to keep in mind that you have the power, but you 
you never misuse this power. So that's why, for example, in that time, the, the 72 percentage of majority said that if we want to change the constitution, then we should do it with a four-fifths majority. Four-fifths because that government wanted to give the chance to the opposition to influence the procedure. So that's why it was a real and I think a decent expectation from our side that if the Fidesz has two-third majority and if they want to change, for example, rewrite the Hungarian constitution, then of course we wanted to have the possibility to influence the procedure, to, to tell them what is our opinion, what we want to see in this constitution. But as you may know, the situation was not that. Because with the two-third majority, Fidesz just decided and rewrote uh, this constitution, and it was accepted by just the Fidesz and the Christian Democrats in, in Hungary. So that's why we say that this is a one-party constitution, because uh, it lacks uh, any kind of national consensus. And this kind of procedure, how they change the Hungarian constitution, uh, uh, it's, it's like how they use the political power in Hungary. So you can see as a, as a good example, good example, to understand what the Urban government is doing and how they do it in Hungary. And of course, there were several other initiatives of the government, which I think are uh, unprecedented uh, in, in, in Europe. For example, in Hungary, we have several uh, retroactive legislation, which is unprecedented in the Hungarian uh, history. And these retroactive legislation cause harms to several Hungarian uh, social groups and uh, segments of the society. You may know that uh, Mr. Orban uh, nominated several important, uh, several people, former Fidesz politicians to important positions, uh, which were before independent positions, and uh, he wanted to somehow strengthen his power in an administrative way for the long future, for nine years or eight years' time, uh, to have these people in that position. Because if they lose the next, if they lose the next uh, elections, then of course they will have some kind of uh, milestones and, and people in power to, to somehow influence the next government's uh, possibilities. So, of course, I could mention the media law, and I could mention several other uh, issues in this regard. Just the infringement procedures. It's about the Hungarian National Bank. They wanted to influence the Hungarian National Bank, and there was a legislation about that which, were, which was passed in December. Uh, now, this is one field for the Commission where they launched this infringement procedure. The other one is the retirement age of the uh, uh, judiciary uh, sector because they want to change several positions uh, in, this, uh, uh, in this segment, and they want to influence, of course, uh, this uh, uh, field. And of course, the third one, uh, is the office of the Ombudsman, which was a very good office in Hungary. It was a, a well appreciated uh, person who led this uh, uh, office. So all these are the fields where Mr. Orban wants to build in his power for long run. And uh, not just when they are in power, but just afterwards also, uh, when they are not uh, power and they are out of the uh, power. And the last one, which is very important for an uh, opposition party, that's the election law. You may have heard that they changed the election law without any kind of consensus. They rewrite the constituencies uh, in Hungary. Uh, before we had 176 constituencies. There was an agreement among the political parties that we reduced the number of the seats in the parliament to 200. Now we have 386 uh, seats. But uh, we expected to have this kind of uh, the procedure as a common or joint effort, uh, how can we elaborate a new election law? The new election law, of course, uh, is in favor of Fidesz. The new constituencies are in favor of uh, Fidesz, so they uh, uh, rewrote these uh, constituencies to have a better, uh, 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 better voting audience in these constituencies. And of course, they, they use their power to, to, to change the whole election law uh, in their favor. The problem is with this election law that this is not uh, representing the wish of the people. Uh, and of course, the problem is that this is against small parties and this is against the formation of uh, new parties in Hungary. So uh, this 
new glacial law is good for the parties which has nationwide network and branches everywhere uh, in the country. That's why it was very important for us to keep the, hung the Hungarian Socialist Party uh, uh, vivid in the whole country. So now we have branches everywhere in the, in the country and we have a nationwide coverage uh, with activists and infrastructure, which is very important and will be very important at the next elections. So, uh, the first field is the uh, democratic issues and the uh, rule of law and checks and balances. So our job will be, uh, if we have the possibility in the next uh, years to, to govern the country, to, to change this legislation, to lead Hungary back to the uh, rule of law, uh, and uh, to keep the checks and balances uh, still in the Hungarian political life. Because every power, every government needs checks and balances. That's the main pillar of the democracy. <coughs> Just to have some kind of control and limitation of the power. And that's what is missing now in Hungary. And that's why a lot of Hungarians you know, have the opinion now that it was a mistake to give two-third majority to the uh, uh, Fidesz. Of course, uh, they could use the two-third majority for, a, for a good purposes also. Because in Hungary, it's quite sure that we need structural reforms in the country. But uh, we need structural reforms with, which uh, serve it serves the country's interests for a run, on the long run. And now what they change as a structural reform, it's against the Hungarian national interest, and it's, uh, it doesn't help the success of the country in the future. So that's why uh, we will have a lot of things to do uh, afterwards. But in this field, it's quite visible what you have to change if you are in, 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 in a, a governing position. Because basically, you have to go back uh, to the uh, normal uh, uh, checks and balances uh, system that it was before in the last uh, 20 years in the country after the transition. The second very important field is the international relations the, uh, European policy of the government. Now in Hungary, I think what you have seen perhaps in Brussels, the Prime Minister changed his mood and approach because now the Prime Minister was uh, very much cooperative when he uh, went to the uh, EU summit. And it's a good sign. Uh, but uh, I have a feeling and my estimation is that the Prime Minister doesn't want to change his policy in Hungary and uh, his approach either. Uh, it's a tactical change or tactical retreat what the Prime Minister showed in, in Brussels because he used a double speech. He used the language in Brussels which was, uh, which was nice and, and cooperative and ready for compromises but of course they used a different language when they, they uh, were at home in, in Hungary just to make know uh, there was a peace of march that was a demonstration uh, for Mr. Orban and just two days before, when Mr. Orban uh, went to, to Brussels to have some kind of agreement on negotiations with Mr. Barroso, uh, the March main slogan was that we don't want to be a colony and the European Union is equal with the Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. So it's quite difficult to, to have this support from Hungary and afterwards and agree with these kind of uh, opinions in Hungary and then go to Brussels and talk to the Commission that we are ready co to compromise and to accept. Uh, the, the uh, EU uh, request. So this double speech is quite uh, uh, quite usual in Hungary regarding the Prime Minister's uh, uh, language. What we see that the Prime Minister would like to use the skepticism which is now in, in Hungary regarding the uh, European Union just to somehow keep together the Fidesz voting uh, electorate. And I think this is not a good way of doing politics because uh, we are very much committed as the Hungarian Socialist Party uh, to the European Union, to the integration, the in enlargement of the European Union, and to the core values of the European Union. Because uh, Europe is not just a community based on interest. That's very important. This is one pillar. But the other pillar is that uh, this is a community which is based on, uh, based on common values. So that's why it's very important for Hungary to be part of this uh, culture, this community, and of course Europe needs Hungary also as your uh, head of state, uh, Mr. Fischer, just declared uh, some days ago. So I think he's uh, very much right. 
So the Hungary Socialist Party uh, always and now and in the future will support the European Union and we think that this is our real national interest. The real national interest is that we should be at the table where all the decisions are, are taken because then you can influence the procedure, you can influence the circumstances uh, of the decisions and not to be on the other side where you have to just you know, take for granted what is, uh, what is happening and you have to accept all the decisions. So that's why we, we are very much keen on, for example, to join Hungary in this uh, fiscal compact pact, which is now the main issue or topic in, in Brussels. That's why we said uh, in the parliament that uh, we support the government to join uh, this uh, new initiative because this is very important for, for Hungary. In that time, the prime minister said that I'm wrong and uh, he doesn't want to support this, uh, this pact. Uh, nowadays he changed his mind, thanks for that, and he said the same that we, we just uh, explained in the parliament, that this is very important for, for Hungary. Of course, not, not to accept everything which is in the, the treaty, but we have to go there and defend our national interest and, and give reasons why we want to any kind of change. So our policy is that the isolation is not good for Hungary, it's not good for Hungary if you have an approach which is uh, always, always a quite combative approach. You, you cannot have always war on everything. And uh, that's why perhaps it's a good sign that the Prime Minister changed. But even, as I just said, I think this is just a technical uh, change. One good message can be understandable for the Hungarians, because generally, of course, the foreign policy, this is not the main issue among the uh, voters, but one, one sign uh, could be uh, visible and important for them is that when the Prime Minister is ready for compromise and uh, he doesn't want to attack anyone, then, for example, the Hungarian foreign goes stronger. The CDS ranking went down. So for the Hungarians, for their pocket, just to be very uh, frank, it's good when you are trying to find partners and not uh, enemies, produce enemies. So that's why perhaps it's uh, easily uh, understandable that always better to have some kind of uh, uh, cooperative manner and approach than, than some combative one. Um, of course, if I just uh, said some words about the, the, the fiscal pact, I, uh, we share the opinion of uh, Mr. Uh, Feynman and all the other socialist prime ministers because we had a meeting in Brussels also and uh, we think that this treaty is just uh, one side of the coin. Uh, it should add some other issues which are very important now in Europe and in Hungary also. This is uh, not just a fiscal balance, which is very important, but you should add uh, the sustainable growth, the job creation, and the social cohesion. Because without these three, it's quite difficult to manage for the long run uh, this kind of uh, fiscal stability and balance without any social tensions in different countries. So uh, that's the second one, second field. And the third one is, of course, the economic policy of, of Hungary. Uh, nowadays in Hungary, we have a lot of uh, 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 nice stories and jokes about the economic policy of Mr. Matolci and Mr. Orban, because this is a non-orthodox a revolutionary economic policy. In the parliament, I'm economist, so uh, the prime minister is lawyer. So perhaps that's, that's the problem why he could not understand that this unorthodox economic policy doesn't work. In the parliament, he said once that, yes, he knows that uh, there is no economic books uh, where you can find this solution as a real effective solution. But they will write this book on the basis of the Hungarian example. And we will see that the whole Europe will follow the Hungarian example. Well, I respect his optimism, but I have some doubts about that. Because uh, what I see in Hungary, that this policy doesn't work, simply doesn't work. It caused several problems. There is no growth in Hungary, furthermore, our estimation is there will be recession in this year in Hungary. The second thing is that uh, they, they spent a lot of money to reduce the public debt. It was uh, 80%, 81% before uh, when they came into power. They just 
took the private pension funds from the people, and with this amount of money, which was a huge amount of money, they reduced the public debt. But it was just once. And of course, every economist knows and observes that in this regard, the most important thing to see the tendency, if the country can reduce the public debt continuously, that's more important than the scale, how much you can reduce once uh, uh, this uh, number. So uh, they have done this, and now the public debt is higher than it was before. It's more than 82 percentage, just because of the fact that the devaluation of the Hungarian foreign, which is, of course, there are several international uh, influence and, and aspect of this crisis, but there are some uh, typical Hungarian problems, uh, which are the reasons behind all this. Because if you compare with the regional uh, economies, uh, the Polish, uh, the Bulgarian, the Romanian, the Czech, or the Slovak uh, example, then you see that the Hungarian economy is much more vulnerable than these economies. So, of course, the international crisis, of course, is badly affect Hungary. I don't want to deny it. Just one quote, Mr. Orban denied it when we were in power. He said that uh, if a government wants, which was in the situation in 2008, a strong government can manage without any pain uh, the international crisis, so just a more or quote. No, I don't want to say that because this is not true. Yes, it's very difficult to manage a crisis. It's a, it's, it's a real danger for all the societies and countries and economies uh, everywhere here. But there are some problems uh, which are based on the bad economic policy of the government. So that's why we always urge and ask the government to change this policy. And you know, they say that, of course, this is just a criticism of the left. It's not true. Because now in Hungary, several conservative, conservative, right-wing economists say the same than we, we, say in the last, we said in the last one and a half year. I can tell you several names uh, who are very much close to Fidesz. One of them, Mr. Bob Peter Rakos, who is a uh, very uh, famous economist in Hungary. He was a prime minister candidate of Fidesz, uh, I think in 2002 or 2006. So uh, they are very close to the Fidesz, they are very close to the prime minister, but even they are criticizing what the, what the economic policy is now in Hungary, and they are criticizing Mr. Matoci, who is called in Hungary the magician, uh, because of his, uh, his policy. So that's why I think we need some change, because uh, the last big decision Investment decision, uh, which uh, which helps Hungary, was made I think in 2008. Since then, just small decisions were made. So the foreign direct direct investment in Hungary now is very very low, historically low. Uh, we have several problems that there is no investment in Hungary. There's new companies who wants to come, or the uh, current companies who are there, they don't want to improve their activities in Hungary because of the uncertainty, the political risk of the Hungarian government. And if you don't have investment, if the economy doesn't grow, then we know all that there won't be any, uh, any change in the unemployment rate and you cannot create jobs. And the biggest problem now in Hungary is that we have a very high unemployment rate and we have to somehow improve our uh, capability to increase uh, uh, the jobs in, in Hungary. That's a huge problem. This is not just a problem of this current government, I, I have to admit. Because in the last 20 years, none of the governments could reach a breakthrough in this field. But anyhow, it's a self-critic also. Anyhow, uh, this government has to do something to, to reach a decent level of, uh, of uh, employment. Because without that, there will be a big uh, social uh, tension in, in, uh, in Hungary. So what we see now, there is no growth in the economy. There will be recession. The public debt again, quite high level. There's no investment in Hungary. The, 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 the consumer, uh, they, I mean, the Hungarian doesn't, uh, uh, doesn't consume more than, than it was before. Uh, the budget is, is uh, very badly uh, elaborated. So our estimation is that they have to adjust the budget <coughs> in this year in quite a short period of time. And of course, the problem is that 
there will be several authority packages in the next uh, year, and this year and the next year, which will influence the Hungarians very painful way. And always, and uh, that's what we think that the IMF and EU agreement, which is now in, uh, I don't know in which phase, but uh, anyhow, at least the government accepted that that's the best way, how can we somehow help the Hungarian economy uh, to have this agreement with IMF and the EU. Which was very interesting, just one story to tell you. In the parliament uh, in December, on Monday, in the question hour of the plenary session of the parliament, we asked Mr. Motoci that what do you think about, Mr. Minister, about the IMF? Uh, should Hungary ask help from IMF? Because we think that it will be important and uh, it will be our national interest to have this kind of safety net from IMF and, uh, and the EU. And he answered to my colleague that no, this kind of policy is ended with your uh, government. We don't like the IMF, uh, we will politicize, we will, we will have a, a policy against IMF. That was on Monday. Uh, on Thursday, I had a chance to talk to the delegation of the IMF and the EU uh, who were there for their current day, uh, yearly uh, session. And on that day, the, in the morning, the government just expressed and launched and, uh, and declared that they want an agreement uh, with IMF. So it was very difficult to follow what the government is doing on Monday. We were very happy, very tough on IMF, and on Thursday they changed their mind and they wanted to have the agreement. So that's why, of course, if the IMF is a little bit reluctant and the EU is a little bit reluctant, then there are some reasons behind all this reluctance. And now what we see is that there's a chief negotiator from our side, from the government's side. But the, the main question is that does he have real political mandate to have a dialogue and negotiation. I mean, Mr. Orban have, has already decided what, what is the position about this, or is there any kind of uh, uh, floating of the, uh, of the opinion and the decision? So we don't know, because we asked several information from them, and we did not get any, any uh, information about these uh, dialogue and negotiations. I just ask the same openness that they asked when they were in opposition. Uh, but nowadays uh, they said that they don't care about the, the opposition and they, they, they follow uh, what they, they want to follow and they don't give any kind of information about that. So I think it's very important for us to somehow gain back uh, the credibility and the trust for the country. And uh, we would support the government and Mr. Orban in this, uh, in this show, in this exercise. Because as a Hungarian, as a Hungarian patriot, uh, my main interest is to help somehow the government and the country to find a way out of this crisis. So I'm not happy with the situation what is uh, in, in Hungary. I'm not happy that, that uh, there is a political, party political uh, chance for us to, to capitalize on this situation. I don't want to capitalize. My interest is to have a good governance in Hungary, but I think the good governance is lacking in Hungary. So uh, that's why we support the government if they want to have uh, this IMF and EU uh, agreement, because we think it's important. But of course, uh, uh, the circumstances are very important. What are the uh, attributes of this uh, contract? We support the Prime Minister to join this uh, EU uh, fiscal uh, compact bank, of course, based on our national uh, interest. And we, of course, would like to support the government to change the unorthodox revolutionary economic policy uh, to some decent and, and uh, normal economic uh, policy. And the fourth big field is the social policy of the government. Because um, nowadays in Hungary, there are some places in the country where the social disaster or, or crisis it's not a danger, it's reality. It's reality. Now in Hungary, 3.7 million people uh, is uh, living around the living wage. Before it was around uh, 3 million. So in the last uh, one and a half <coughs> year, the, the situation uh, uh, getting worse. And I think if the government doesn't care about uh, these segments of the society who are the poor or poorer people, 
then there will be a very big social uh, tension in, in Hungary. And this is very bad for the country and very bad for the political life also, because if a big social tensions uh, you can feel in the uh, social society, then of course always the extreme right can capitalize on this situation. And the extreme right can uh, be stronger and stronger uh, under these circumstances. So that's why if, if we can uh, improve the living standards in Hungary, then of course it's always good for the country, and good for the democracy, and good for the people. Uh, what we see is that the government uh, doesn't care about those people who, who are not so well off. For example, the flat taxation, which is now in, in practice in Hungary, is good for just a, a small segment of the society, those who, who earn more than the average, and those who uh, earn less than the average salary in Hungary, for the majority of these people, this is a bad situation and they can get less money than it was before. Just yesterday, the main commercial channel, TV channel in Hungary, there was a, a news about that around one million people got less salary uh, in this month after January, I mean after the first month, than in December. And I think this is a huge problem. We have more or less between three and four million people who are active so one million or less is around more than 25 percent of the uh, of the of these uh, people so that's why they, they change for example the the financial subsidies after when you are in unemployment uh, situation then uh, it was before nine months the average in, in europe i think that is that's the minimum which is six that everywhere in europe at least you can get some kind of help from the state for six months in hungary now it's three months and if, if the unemployment rate is very high, then it's quite difficult to, to how can they manage that life if, if they are out of the job, they, are, they cannot job because there is no job, <coughs> and then you cannot get any support from the, society, from the, from the uh, state either. So I think uh, there will be a lot of uh, problem in this year, there will be a lot of problem in the next year, in the budget, in the society, so our estimation is that the Fidesz will lose more support in the society. Of course, the big question, who can gain uh, this support? Uh, extreme right, socialists, or, or uh, someone else? Nowadays, uh, the, the voters who, who left Fidesz, they went to the uncertain voters group. Um, and uh, this year will be, or could be, a turning point in this regard also. Because in this year, there will be a lot of effect uh, on the people, uh, which cause uh, very big problems in their daily life. Because the income will be less, the, you know, the cost will be higher. So this situation can, uh, can be very, very uh, delicate uh, in this year. So we think that our main job is that to give an alternative to the people. In this year, we started the uh, uh, elaboration of the program of the Socialist Party, just to explain to people what are all solutions for these uh, main uh, uh, conflicts and problems of the, of the country. And of course, we would like to show the people transparently that what we would like to do if we can gain back the support and uh, uh, get the trust uh, of the people in advance. Because once we committed an error, big mistake because in 2006 and in the campaign we said something and after when we got the power we did something else and of course there was a very harsh and tough punishment on the socialist party because in 2010 uh, sorry to say but uh, we were beaten as hell it was a historical defeat uh, for the Hungarian socialist party so uh, it was a big challenge. How can we maintain the socialist party in the political arena? There were several estimations and, and observations in that time in 2010 that the Hungarian socialist party is dead. You don't have to care about them because they, they will uh, you know, just diminish in the, in, the, in the past. So it was very difficult and challenging uh, job to, to keep the socialist party and strengthen the socialist party and reorganize the party. Now, more or less, in, we are in the mid of this job, and uh, we have to go on in this regard uh, also. So, what is my job and what is my colleague's job is to strengthen the party, show to the people that we've learned the lessons, we know what, are, what were uh, the problems and, and 
uh, mistakes of the former socialist government. So we have a new policy, we have a new organization, and we have new faces as politicians uh, in the socialist party, because with these new faces, we can make our program more credible uh, for the Hungarians. So I want to show them a very transparent alternative uh, just uh, before the elections, just to be able to judge this alternative or the current alternative is the uh, is, uh, best for, for the Hungarians. Uh, and uh, I want to be very frank and responsible to the Hungarian voters because it's a common problem uh, with all political parties that we sometimes uh, in the past uh, 20 years we always said nicer things to the voters than, than was the reality which is not unprecedented in the European political culture either. But anyhow, I think after two elections in 2006 and 2010, when Fidesz promised something, and now they do everything else, but not their promises, so they cannot deliver. And we have done the same more or less in the past. That's why we have to change this kind of approach. And we have to respect more uh, the voters. And, and this uh, respect means uh, to be more transparent and to be uh, much more frank to the people. So, if you have any questions, then I will be ready and happy uh, to answer these uh, questions. And uh, again, thank you very much for your uh, attention, and thank you very, very much for your patience uh, and, uh, and the possibility. Again, just uh, I like to express that I'm very grateful for that. Thank you.